please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Spell your first and last names. Rochelle Jody Cooper. Rochelle, it's R-I-C-H-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Last name Cooper, C-O-O-P-E-R. Good afternoon, Dr. Cooper. Good afternoon. Let me provide you with instructions which I give to every witness in every case. The first of which is to please sit back and relax. The second of which is to speak in a loud voice so all of us can hear you. The third of which is to answer questions yes or no if called for rather than using slang, uh-huh, uh-uh. And the last is to wait until you hear an entire question before responding so that we don't have people speaking over each other even though we think we may know what's being asked. Is that okay? That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Direct. Mr. Walgren. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. Dr. Cooper, uh, where are you employed? I'm employed at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. And we may need uh, you to speak just a little closer to the mic if you could. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And what do you do at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center? I'm an emergency medicine physician. Now, in order to become a, an emergency medicine physician, I want to ask you a bit about your background. Uh, can you tell us your uh, basic educational background uh, that uh, allowed you to pursue a field as an emergency room doctor? Uh, I completed four years of college and had a bachelor's of science and then went on to medical school, which was another four years. Your North bachelor of science was in what? In kinesiology. From and what UCLA. is that? It is um, said it was the science of movement neuro um, processes that assist with movement, anatomy of movement. Okay. And following that, uh, getting into science, what year was that? I finished in 1990. Okay. Following that, what did you do? Then I went on to medical school at the UCLA School of Medicine. Okay. And I earned my MD in 1994. Okay. And then I matched into a residency program. Um, what does that mean? When you finish medical school and you apply for training programs, there is a what's called a match, and you apply to different programs, you interview at programs, and the students are matched with the programs. Okay. And you matched into which program? I matched into emergency medicine at UCLA. Okay. And then following then getting your medical degree in 1994 and then matching into this program, what did that involve for the next year? So, um, emergency medicine in the program I was in is a four-year program. Okay. My first year was an internship, which I actually did at Harbor UCLA. And then I completed three years of emergency medicine training at the UCLA, UCLA All of the Emergency Medicine program. Okay. And that, the first year of that four-year program, the internship, at, uh, that was at Harbor UCLA? That was at Harbor UCLA. What did that involve? That was a, a transitional year internship. It's a rotating internship on various medical services. Okay. Uh, and then the residency, the three years of residency, what did that involve? That was specific training in emergency medicine. Okay. Then what year did you finish uh, your residency fellowship? My residency finished in 1998. Okay. That, that's what I meant. What, you finished your residency in 1998, and then what did you do? Then I actually went for further training and I completed a two-year research fellowship in which I obtained a master's of science in health services from the School of Public Health. Okay. And attended, worked as an emergency, and finished that in 2000. Okay, so during that time, you, you then began actually work as an emergency room doctor. Yes. Okay. And from that point on, uh, what have you done with your career? Um, I've been a faculty member with the UCLA Department of Emergency Medicine. Okay. And when you say you're a faculty member, what does that mean as far as your daily activities? Um, I'm currently an associate professor. I'm involved in working in the emergency department, treating patients in the emergency department, supervising the residents in the emergency department, teaching of the residents, and then other academic teaching, um, research, peer review, journal editing, and other academic pursuits. Okay. 
in addition to the faculty academic pursuits, do you also work in the emergency room uh, on patients on a daily basis? Uh, monthly, we have a certain number of shifts, but yes, on a regular basis. Okay. And are you board certified in emergency medicine? Yes, I am. What does that mean to be board certified? Um, you first need to complete a specific training in emergency medicine to be board eligible, and then you go through a certification process. The initial certification involves first passing a written exam and then passing an oral exam. And then you must continue to have further certifications and sort of approval of and continuation of your education and recertification every 10 years. So I was certified initially in 1999, and I recertified in 2009. Okay, and that's good for another 10 years as long as you're uh, continuing with the education and training? Yes. Now, directing your attention to June 25th, 2000, were you employed, uh, as you've indicated, as an emergency room doctor at, at UCLA Medical Center? Yes. And that was just part of your regular uh, shift on that day? Yes. And did you become aware of uh, uh, radio? Let me strike that. Is there a, a base station in the UCLA emergency room area? Yes, there is. And what does that mean? What is a base station? So we have nurses that are not just trained as emergency nurses. They have specialized training um, called a mobile intensive care nurse or MICN license. They answer radio calls from paramedic runs. They assist with uh, the care of patients that, med that the paramedics provide and may direct the, the care at times if it's not protocol. It may involve the physician to direct the care and then they will notify the local hospital or our team if the, the patient is being transported to us. Okay. So, uh, and I'm just speaking generally just to get an idea of how this works. So if you're uh, the physician working in the emergency room on a particular shift and there's a radio call and the paramedics are out in the field at scene, they will be communicating with the base station nurse? Yes. And as needed, the base station nurse will consult with you to relay information back to the paramedics through the base station nurse? Yes. Okay. And on that day, June 25th, 2009, uh, were you involved in this communication with the base station nurse uh, involving a patient that you subsequently learned was Michael Jackson the decedent in this case? Yes, I was. Okay. And uh, following this base station consultation and communication, uh, the patient, Michael Jackson, was brought to UCLA and you were then the attending emergency room physician, correct? That is correct. Okay. Now prior to that time, uh, so when you're still at the ER communicating through the base station nurse, uh, what was your knowledge prior to Michael Jackson's arrival at UCLA? The radio nurse called me after receiving information from the paramedics. And the nurse scribes a data form called the hospital base station form, which I had. The nurse summarized the information, and I made a determination based on that information to authorize the paramedics to pronounce Mr. Jackson, the patient, I didn't know who it was, um, dead in the field based on the information I had. Okay. And that was at well, when that decision was made, that was at 12.57 p.m.? Yes. Okay. Now, prior to um, your authorization for the paramedics to pronounce Michael Jackson dead at 12.57 p.m., had you been in communication with the base station nurse, kind of in a back and forth uh, capacity? The radio nurse answered the call, um, and actually I was called after, I was not in communication during the initial resuscitation. I was called after the paramedics had attempted resuscitation, had not produced any improvement in the patient's condition. Okay. And so then you were informed that the patient was unresponsive? Correct. Uh, asystolic? Yes. No pulse? Yes. And not breathing? Yes. And you were informed of the uh, attempts that had been made through various starter drugs? Yes. I was informed the patient was intubated 
and that the ventilation was checked and was appropriate. Believe the patient was appropriately being ventilated. They had tried epinephrine and atropine, and the patient remained asystolic. Okay. And based on everything you knew and everything that was relayed to you by the paramedics, uh, you, uh, as the on-site emergency room doctor, authorized uh, the paramedics to pronounce the patient dead? Yes. Okay. And what did you next learn uh, after you granted that authorization? Uh, the radio nurse then called me back and said that there was a physician on scene who was requesting the paramedics provide other medications. Okay, and what happened then? I, at that point, the, the medication that was requested was sodium bicarbonate, the medicine that if you were to proceed and continue attempting to resuscitation would be appropriate. And I then said that yes, if this was a physician with a license, the paramedics could administer that medication at that physician's discretion. However, they would need to begin to transport the patient to the local hospital. And okay. that physician would have to take over control of the resuscitation and travel with the patient in the ambulance. Okay. And just backing up for a minute, Dr. Cooper, regarding pronouncement of death, are there certain uh, um, protocols that are followed, certain information that you need to retain uh, before you would make such a pronouncement, in addition to what I listed off earlier? The report I had was that on arrival, when the paramedics arrived, the patient was, had no signs of life, was clinically dead, had an attempted resuscitation, and the estimated time down was at least 40 minutes, which in the L.A. County field protocol, once resuscitation attempts have been made for about 20 minutes with no improvement, it meets protocol for pronouncement. Okay. And had you also been informed that the pupils were fixed and dilated? Yes. Okay. And then with the amount of time that resuscitation had, efforts had been ongoing, in addition to the physical characteristics that have been described to you, uh, consistent with the protocols, that's when the pronouncement of death was authorized? Yes. Okay. Now, when you then learned that the personal physician wished to accompany uh, Michael Jackson, um, that's when you authorized or uh, directed, rather, that the physician would have to accompany the patient to UCLA? Yes. If a physician is going to take over base station control and order treatments of the paramedics, that is a requirement. Okay. So at that point, at least while uh, Mr. Jackson was at the uh, 100 North Carrollwood location uh, and during transport to UCLA, uh, the personal physician would be the one uh, who had assumed care? Correct. Now, do you recall about what time the paramedics arrived at UCLA? I believe it was around 1.13, 1.14. Okay. And upon arrival at UCLA Medical Center, um, at that point, is care then uh, taken from the personal physician and uh, taken over by you, the attending emergency room doctor? Correct. Is that what happened? Yes. Okay. And... Do you recall uh, where you were when uh, Michael Jackson, the decedent in this case, was first brought into uh, the hospital? When I had, I had already been sort of prepared that um, we had a patient who was um, being resuscitated coming in. I was standing right outside the trauma bay so I could see that it arrived. Okay. Your Honor, I have a series of photographs here I'd like to mark them in order. They've been shown to defense counsel previously. Again, shown Mr. Chernow. Uh, photograph of a trauma room. Uh, may this be marked Peoples 47. Go ahead and order and I'll mark them at the end. Okay. Uh, same, same room, different vantage point, Peoples 48. Close up of uh, medical equipment, people's 49, and a picture of a hallway looking out to the paramedic bay, people's 50. 
47250. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. I take a quick look at them. Again, sure. Cooper, do you see uh, People's 50 up on the screen? Yes. Okay. And do you recognize what is shown in People's 50? Because it's the hallway, the back hallway um, where our two trauma bays are. Where, I'm sorry, where what? We have two trauma bays, okay. and that's the hallway. And at the end of the picture, that is the ambulance arrival. Okay, you say the end of the picture. I'm pointing here yes. to these glass doors to the rearmost section of the photograph. Is that where the ambulance would pull in to... Uh, bring in a patient? Yes. Okay. And looking then from this vantage point to the right of the hallway, is this the trauma room? Uh, yes. To which Michael Jackson was taken? Yes. Okay. So when uh, you indicated that uh, prior to uh, the paramedics arrival with Michael Jackson, you were prepared, what did you do to prepare? I, I supervised residents, so I, we had the residents when we have a code coming, there are a number of um, additional um, providers who are called. So a pharmacist was called and was in the department in the trauma bay waiting. A respiratory therapist would already be there. Our social worker would be notified. And the chargers would assign nurses to the room. Okay. I would then prepare my residents for what needed to be done immediately when the patient assigned who would be assessing the um, endotracheal tube, who would be assessing for pulse, who would be looking at the heart, and what we would initially do. Okay. So if you could, uh, the, the team that was being assembled prior to Mr. Jackson's arrival, that included yourself? Yes. Um, and you mentioned residents. How many residents? There were three, I think, believe, initially in the room, and there's another resident who had come to check and assist. So it, there were four of my residents in the room. Okay. May we turn up the light for a please, moment or, or not? Please, please. That's fine. Right. May we? Thank you. <clears throat> so you, the four residents, any technicians? Um, there were, I believe, a couple emergency medicine technicians to okay. perform CPR, help placement patient on the monitor. I'm sorry, to perform CPR and help place they, the patient? They're the ones who will place the patient on the monitor, will help run or grab equipment and assist us. Okay. We're, we're having some audio issues. Is, is there a way to turn it up? Or Dr. Cooper, could you see if that works? Uh, so sometimes a little tough to hear witnesses. Thank okay. you. Okay. In addition to the technicians, was there a respiratory therapist? Yes. And what is that person's role? That person is responsible for continually bagging, um, delivering ventilations to the patient through the endotracheal tube. Okay. And you. It's better. Thank you. Okay. And you had indicated before a scribe nurse. Was a scribe nurse part of this team? That is one of the nurses, yes. And what's the scribe nurse's job? Their job is solely to record information as it's called out by the team. And they may also be, there's a phone next to where the scribe nurse is. So when I ask for a cardiology consult, the scribe nurse it may be the one to tell the central work area to call. Okay. And then uh, were there any other circulating nurses? There were probably two, if not three. And what is their uh, responsibility in this type of situation? So um, we'll attempt to obtain IV access. They will draw bloods as we ask them. They will administer the medications that I ordered. OK. And uh, additionally, you, you had indicated a pharmacist? Yes. OK, so the pharmacist is actually on scene in the emergency room? Yes. And I believe you'd said a social worker? Yes. And what is that person's job? A social worker will assist in many ways. Typically, we'll gather information to contact the family and or contact a primary care physician to obtain extra information to help me out if there are family members or witnesses um, who had come in. Um, she will assist or he will assist them so they're not left alone. Okay. And then um, a charge nurse, what is that? 
a charge nurse is, in, is the person who is assigned to the emergency department and covering sort of all of the patients who would be available to assist and make sure if we needed other staff could assign. Okay. So uh, at this time then on, on this day of June 25th, the team you assembled, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it entailed you, uh, four residents, uh, at least two techs, a respiratory therapist, a scribe nurse, two circulating nurses, a pharmacist, a charge nurse, and a social worker. Does that sound accurate? That would be the team that started, yes. And when you say the team that started, what do you mean by that? Um, there were additional members, doctors who came as consulted um, by me, and because this was Mr. Jackson, there became security and privacy issues. There were additional administrative people who okay. were involved. But as far as medical, uh, the initial recounting I gave, that's 14 people. Does that sound accurate? Yes. And then other doctors were consulted as needed? Yes. So once you have the team together and everyone knows their duties and responsibilities, uh, where were you when you first saw or, yes, first saw Mr. Jackson being brought in? I was right outside the trauma bay door. Okay. And is that uh, the trauma bay door would be then what you previously identified to the right of People's 50? Is that accurate? That would be accurate. Okay. So were you in this hallway here? Yes. And were you looking uh, outward through these glass doors? Yes. Okay. And as Mr. Jackson was brought in uh, to the hospital, were you, did you meet someone who identified himself as his personal doctor? I believe, and it may have been my charge, or someone went out, was outside and met the ambulance and sort of indicated this is the physician. It okay. may have been the paramedics, may have been one of my nurses. Okay. Yes. But brought the physician to you? Okay. And did you speak to the personal physician at that time? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you see that person in court here today? Yes, I do. Could you identify that individual, please? I'm sitting second of left. Maybe describe what he's wearing. Um, a dark suit and a light green tie. Pointing to and identifying Dr. Murray, the defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. And as the emergency room doctor, uh, and knowing that a personal physician uh, was present at the house and was present at UCLA, what is your main goal at that point as far as getting information from the personal physician? So, My main goal is to manage uh, the care of Mr. Jackson. And to do that, I took an initial brief history to try and get as much information as possible while the paramedics were tra transferring the patient from their gurney to our gurney and the patient was being placed on our equipment. Okay. And did you, then while they're transferring Mr. Jackson uh, into the trauma room and transferring <coughs> from one gurney to your, uh, to your area, uh, were you speaking to Dr. Murray? Yes. What did you ask him? I asked what happened. What did he tell you? Uh, I was told that Mr. Jackson had been working very long hours, and Dr. Murray thought he had been dehydrated, and that he had given the patient an IV and administered two milligrams of lorazepam. Okay. And then later had given him another two milligrams of lorazepam and observed the patient to arrest. Okay, let, let me stop you. Uh, did you ask? Dr. Murray, if the patient had been ill at all? I asked several questions. I'm not sure which questions I asked in the initial brief contact because I then was going to turn to the patient. I asked several questions about the history sort of in, in between managing the care of Mr. Jackson. Was it represented to you by Conrad Murray that Michael Jackson had not been ill? He, he reported he had not been ill. Okay. Been working hard and he was dehydrated? Yes. <coughs> And did you specifically ask about any medications uh, Michael Jackson had been given? Yes. And specifically in response to that question, what were you told? I was told he was given the Razapam through an IV and then was given a second dose. Okay. And so that was when you asked Conrad Murray what medications had been given, you were told two milligrams of Lorazepam by IV. Yes. And then subsequently another two milligrams of lorazepam. Correct. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Were you ever told at any point in time 
about any medications by Conrad Murray other than the lorazepam? No. Now, you'd indicate, told you, uh, in addition to the total of four milligrams of lorazepam, uh, I think you indicated that he said he witnessed the arrest? Yes. Uh, what does a witnessed arrest mean? It is an observed arrest. The critical event happens while you are with the patient. Okay. And when you say the, the critical event happens when you're with the patient, uh, what is the critical event when you're referring to a witnessed arrest? The patient stops breathing and their heart stops. Okay. And in, to medical doctors and in people in the field, it means you were literally on site and you saw it happen? Yes. As you, were there uh, reoccurring conversations with Conrad Murray as you're treating uh, Mr. Jackson? Yes. Okay. At any time during to save Mr. Jackson, uh, did Conrad Murray uh, present you with any medical records or any documentation of any vital signs or any medical documentation whatsoever? No. And in your subsequent conversations then with Conrad Murray as you're, as you're working on the patient, uh, did you learn that uh, there had been mention of Valium and Flomax? I asked what the patient's other medications are. When I was, those were the two medications were reported that he, or his routine medications. Okay, so uh, when you were inquiring about the lorazepam, uh, that was an inquiry about what he had been given, I assume, prior to the witnessed arrest? I asked what, what had happened and was told he was given medic, lorazepam and that observed the arrest. I okay. wasn't, didn't that, know what to expect or wasn't what medications were given because I did not know what the circumstance of the arrest were. Okay, so when you, you simply asked what happened and he responded by telling you about the lorazepam. Yes. Okay. And regarding the, the Valium and Flomax, that was in response to a question about what is he regularly taking? Yes. Okay. And what is Valium? It's a benzodiazepine, a sedative, anxiolytic. A sedative what? It's a sedative and an anxiolytic. Okay. I, I can't make that out. Anxiolytic, anti-anxiety. Thank you. Anti-anxiety medication? Yes. Okay. And Flomax is what? It's a medication that um, sort of relaxes um, urinary smooth muscle. So generally given to maybe an individual with a large prostate who is frequently urinating. It can also be used in individuals who have a kidney stone. Okay. Then other than the, uh, when you said what happened, and you mentioned lorazepam, and then the regular medications being Flomax, were any other medications mentioned by Dr. Murray? No. At any time during your care for Mr. Jackson? No. Did you make an inquiry about any past medical history? Yes. What did you ask? I asked what other medical problems Mr. Jackson had, if he had any cardiac history, if he had ever had a history of a blood clot, if he had any history of drug use. And in response to that question regarding no to, medical history, what were you told? Sorry, no to all of them. Did you ask about any seizure history? When I was attempting to determine what had happened with the arrest, I went back and asked about further details and asked if he witnessed seizure activity when he witnessed the arrest, if he had, if the patient had complained of chest pain associated with the arrest, and I was told. Okay. Did you make any inquiries about whether or not the uh, patient, Michael Jackson, had been subject to any uh, physical trauma, or did you make physical observations yourself as to, to determine if there's any physical trauma? That's compound. Okay. We ask Let me ask you just your own observations. Uh, did you note any physical trauma that would explain uh, Mr. Jackson's condition? No, there were no physical signs of trauma. Okay. Now, from your own personal observations, what was Mr. Jackson's condition upon arrival at UCLA? His condition was as described by the paramedics. He was clinically dead. 
he did not have a pulse. The rhythm on the cardiac monitor was what I would call as wide, slow, an agonal heart rhythm, um, sort of a sign of a dying heart. Okay. Um, his pupils were fixed and dilated. When you say a sign of a dying heart, but you also said he was clinically dead, can yes. you explain that? The heart muscle is um, contractile, and it also has, has its own intrinsic electroactivity, and so the heart may still ha produce a signal, and we call it pulseless electrical activity, but clinically there is no pulse or sign of life. Okay. So he was clinically dead. Uh, I believe you said his eyes were fixed and dilated? Yes. Um, was there any spontaneous respiration? No. And you said the rhythm was slow and wide, and I believe you said with no palpable pulses? No palpable pulses. And what does that mean? That means when we attempted to determine if we could feel a pulse, suggesting his heart was beating and generating a, any sort of blood pressure or perfusion, there was none. Okay. Now, despite this condition, in your opinion, of Michael Jackson being clinically dead upon arrival, um, were attempts made to revive Mr. Jackson? Yes. And as the emergency room physician, did you supervise and uh, physically handle most of those attempts? Yes. Okay. And can you describe that, please, for us, uh, exactly what transpired? So when he first arrived, um, we confirmed that the endotracheal tube, the breathing tube, was in the correct place. We it then, was in the correct place? Yes, it was. Okay. We confirmed with um, bagging and ventilating that the chest was rising, that we had breath sounds such that we knew we were breathing for the patient. I had confirmed there was no pulse. We instituted CPR. And then we proceeded to give medications in an attempt to resuscitate Mr. Jackson. Okay. So the endotracheal tube, how were you able to confirm that that was correctly placed? By direct visualization. Okay. And what is it that you would see? You would put a blade. It's sort of, it's called a laryngoscope blade, um, and you directly look to see that the endotracheal tube is actually going through the vocal cords into the trachea. Okay, and that's what you were able to confirm? Yes. Is that yes? That's correct. Okay. And did you utilize an ultrasound at that point? We did early on use an, an ultrasound to examine the heart. Okay, and can you explain that device and what the purpose of that was? Um, in the emergency department, we will frequently perform limited ultrasound. Um, I guess the most common reason people think of an ultrasound is when you're doing sort of prenatal care and looking at a baby. It is a device that is used by cardiol. I'm having a little trouble hearing. Okay. Could you repeat that? Yeah. I think most people lay would consider an ultrasound we look at when we're looking at a baby. It's different than an x-ray. Um, it gives us information about the chambers of the heart. Okay. Um, cardiologists would perform an echo. Echo, they do echo, which is to that type of ultrasound. It's much more detailed than the limited ultrasound that we perform in the emergency department. Okay. Uh, looking at what was marked, people's 47. May we dim the lights, please, Your Honor? Please. Doctor, is this the, the actual trauma bay? Uh, where you worked on Michael Jackson? Yes. I'm going to hand you this pointer. Okay. Or you, I'm sorry, you have one there. You could use the pointer. And if you could just. How do I oops, turn it on? Is it on? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, let's, let's start to the leftmost part of the photograph. This uh, appears to be a computer screen. And is that a keyboard? That is a computer screen. Okay, and what is that? Um, that is one of our computers that has, um, we have an electronic tracking system and computerized order entry, and the system is loaded on that computer. In addition, it has um, web access and so that we can access medical records while we're in the resuscitation suite if we need to. Okay. And then... Let me switch from People's 47 to People's 48. Please. 
looking closer to the corner of the room there. Uh, could this be uh, the bed where Michael Jackson was placed? Yes. Okay. okay. And what's the term for this? Uh, it's a trauma gurney. Okay. And describe for us what we see then in the photograph beyond the gurney, all of this medical equipment here. This uh, tool chest is our airway equipment. And, what, um, and you've indicated the, the large tool chest with uh, appears to be uh, colored doors, white box. Yes. Is that, is that where you're pointing? Yes. Okay. And what type of airway equipment is in there? Um, there are endotracheal tubes. There are other advanced airway devices. If we were attempting to intubate a patient and we could not place an endotracheal tube, we have um, rescue airway devices. Okay. Um, and above this, uh, the airway equipment, this monitor here, what is it? That's the cardiac monitor that the patient who is in the trauma room would be placed on. Okay. And what type of readings would that give you? That would have a... Um, EKG rhythm it, and sort of heart rate. It would have blood pressure. It would have the oxygen saturation. If the patient had an arterial line, as Mr. Jackson did, the tr pressure tracing would be um, connected and shown on the monitor. Okay. And this would all, uh, the readings that would be on this monitor would be from sensors and devices attached to the patient? Correct. Okay. In this area, then, in the photograph, which would be to the right of the airway equipment and the monitoring uh, screen, what is shown here? There is, it's a little hard to see, there, this is actually a portable monitor and defibrillator. Okay. And you've pointed, is that this? Where you said. And, okay, um, to the right of the path. airway equipment? Yes. Okay. And although it's not clear to see here, there's a ventilator here. Okay. And then how about this device to the right of the defibrillator, uh, this pole, and then a, a device on top? Um, without seeing a close-up picture of it, I'm not sure if that, which uh, part of our equipment this is. Okay, let me see if I can. Are you able to tell, or is it too blurred? It's a little bit blurred. I think this is one of our um, smaller ventilator devices and not our... Other airway device. It's a smaller ventilator device? I, I believe it's, um, there's an oxygen tank. I believe this is portable vendor and this is a, a bag valve mask, but I would have to look at the, be in the room and look at it to okay. be sure I'm not misspeaking. And okay. And going beyond that, um, what is this cabinet here uh, immediately to the right of that equipment? Um, this cabinet has several different trays. Um, various equipment we would use in the resuscitation of a patient. This is a trauma bay, so there are um, tubes so that we, there are trays that we can crack a patient's chest open so that we can place tubes in people's chest. Um, if we needed to do what's called a tracheostomy um, and sort of an airway where we went directly into the neck, that equipment is held, is, um, held here. There are um, central line kits, sort of um, type of IV kits that we will use. When you, when you said a tracheostomy when you go straight into the neck, what, what is that exactly? Um, instead of the endotracheal tube where we go through the mouth with a tube into the trachea, um, in some people that's not possible and they will have an airway where directly into the neck and place it. Emergency physicians typically will not put in a tracheostomy tube. That would be done by a head and neck surgeon, but we have the equipment here in case it's needed. Okay, but that would be where you couldn't use an endotracheal tube, but you needed to ventilate? Correct. Okay. Uh, and then you mentioned at the, you mentioned at the bottom there um, the equipment for a central line. Is that what you said? Correct. And what's a central line? Um, a central line is, in essence, a larger and longer IV that allows us to access the central circulation quicker than would be a IV that was placed peripherally. Okay. In an arm. How is a central line uh, put in place or administered? So central lines are placed by the physicians. Um, they are initially, it's a, what we call the Seldinger technique. The, we I'm will, sorry, the what? There's a special technique that we use where we use um, a needle to puncture the vessel. 
we then introduce a wire and guide the wire through the, to the vessel. We then introduce a catheter over the wire into the vessel. Okay. And going then to the right of uh, the equipment you've described, um, and I'm going to switch photographs as we move through the room, people's 49. Looking at People's 49, uh, you recognize this as the same cabinet you just described on Correct. the left side of People's 49? Yes. Okay. So going then, uh, continuing rightward around the room, uh, what is this cabinetry or glass enclosed uh, uh, location here? That uh, has some IV fluids and I believe IV medications. Okay. And is that a refrigerated? Uh, cabinet or what is that? I would have to ask one of my nurses. I don't access these medications. Okay. And what is this uh, cabinet then going to the right of the, where the IV fluids are? That's what we would call one of our medication pixis. And what is that? There are several drawers here. Um, and medications that we would typically use in the emergency department are sort of locked in this cabinet. Okay. The nurse will log on to this computer screen, log in the patient that the medication is being used, identify the ma medication that is needed, and that drawer will be accessed and they will then note which medication was taken from the cabinet. Okay. So the, the medications are locked inside this cabinet um, and then by use of this computer one can gain applications? Correct. Okay. Is it password protected or? Yes. Okay. Going then to the right, uh, the Pixis system, uh, where well you can see it from there, this cabinet here, uh, what is that? Uh, that's a cabinet um, that contains bags of IV fluid. Okay. You don't want to get into a new area. Is this a good time? Yes, it is. Thank you. May we turn on the lights, Mrs. Vincent, and the IC Council, please?